Welcome everyone to Meet the Researchers, our global. Now I'm just going to test here. Right. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Jane Dean and I'm from the advancement team here at IMB. So before we uh, begin today at Meet the Researchers, our global warriors, we'd like to do the acknowledgement of country. So we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and descendants who continue their cultural and spiritual connections to country and recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So welcome to IMB. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here in person, those that are here in person and those that are online with us today via Zoom. So the Meet with the Researcher series has been a really wonderful way for us to engage with the public about what our researchers are doing. So we've held, uh, this will be our fourth one this year, and we do intend on bringing these back next year as well, uh, because we love the connection it gives us to our community. So this week is World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. And at IMB, we are tackling the problem of drug resistant bacteria through developing new diagnostics and treatments and by empowering the community with knowledge on how to fight back against the threat of superbugs. So two of our presenters today specifically work in the field of antimicrobial research. And our third presenter is a microscopy expert who works uh, with all of IMB, helping our researchers solve puzzles on a, in a microscopic space. And microscopy is really the heart of IMB. And given that it's the focus of one of our talks today, I've got a special present for those that are in the room. So do make sure you um, grab a purple bag before you leave today. And this is a special paper microscope. So it's basically a bit of origami. It's made out of paper, but there are glass slides in it. And it is a real working microscope that you could use. Or if you have uh, young people in your life, it is fantastic for them as well to really inspire them to get into science. So they cost $1.75 to make. Uh, it was made by two bioengineers from Stanford University. So they wanted to make a research quality microscope out of paper to make it uh, affordable for anyone all over the world to actually conduct research. Uh, so the origami style microscope magnifies 140 times and that's enough to see blood cells and bacteria. So it's a nice little gift for you here today. And before we start our presentations, we would like to acknowledge our Director Circle members who are with us today. So we have Dr. Catherine Lawrence and Jeff Lawrence, Dr. Selwyn Russell and Patricia Ash. So thank you for joining us today. So without further ado, we're going to welcome our very first guest, which is Professor Matt Sweet. So Professor Matt Sweet is a group leader and NHMRC Leadership Fellow and Director of Higher Degree Research at IMB. His lab studies the innate immune system, the body's first line of defence against infection and injury. So thank you, Matt, for joining us. And we look forward to hearing about your work and how it ties to Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week. Yeah. Yep. Thanks uh, very much, SJ. And Thank you all to all of you for, uh, for turning up today, uh, whether you're here in person or on Zoom. Hello the, to those on Zoom. Um, and it's great to get, have the opportunity to present today. And, and I think the theme was our global warriors. And I'm going to try to cover three different global warriors in uh, today's short presentation. So uh, let me see if I can get going. Uh, and the first global warrior that I'm going to talk about really is actually a bit of a silent global warrior. And so all of you sitting in the audience or at home on Zoom or wherever you are on Zoom uh, are constantly being bombarded by microbes that have the potential to cause you harm, whether they're bacteria, viruses, parasites, or fungi. And the food you might have just eaten or, drinking or drunk or the air that you've breathed in or some surface you've touched or if you get a, a bite or a, a, an injury, these are all ways that we can obviously get infected. Um, but we have this global warrior called the innate immune system, which is constantly protecting us from microbial challenge. So every time we encounter microbes that have the potential to cause us infection, we have part of our immune system called the innate immune system that acts as a frontline defense, detecting danger in, in the form of infection or other, or, or other types of danger and protecting us from those uh, dangers. So in, in that sense, it's a global warrior. And so what you see in this video here 
is actually a particular cell type of the innate immune system. So this is a video of white blood cells. So you can see these little green blobs uh, crawling along a blood vessel. These white blood cells are called macrophages, uh, which literally means big eaters. And that's why I like these cells. They're like myself a big eater. Uh, and you can see these guys crawling along uh, blood vessels. And what they're doing is searching the environment for any signs of danger. So these macrophages are present in every tissue in our body, and they're on the on the um, the lookout for any sorts of danger, whether that be an infection or something else. And so, uh, just like any system, the innate immune system can sometimes fail. And when the innate immune system fails, of course, we then uh, um, come down with an infection. So you might have a, a chest infection or a respiratory infection or some other infection which makes us sick, and if it gets really bad, can be severe disease. And uh, we refer to those agents that, um, that cause disease, uh, those infectious agents that cause disease, uh, as pathogens or pathology generators. So that's the term pathogen, where, where the term pathogen comes from. Now, um, so the, I guess the official terminology or, or description for pathogen would be any infectious agents that can cause a disease. But I have a different definition for a pathogen. I have the definition as in any infectious agent that can overcome the innate immune system. Because we have this functioning innate immune system that protects us, the only way that we can get an infectious disease is when a pathogen overcomes the innate immune system. So if that infection is a bacterial infection, um, many of you in the audience will, will obviously be aware that we've got antibiotics to treat bacterial infections. So antibiotics directly target bacteria, so they they uh, use uh, methods to kill bacteria because bacteria are unique um, uh, to our own human cells. And so there are antibiotics that directly kill bacteria via various means. And so we can treat bacterial infections when they get serious, as you'll be well aware, with antibiotics. And so we have this, if our innate immune system fails, of course, we've got antibiotics to treat bacterial infections. So uh, in some ways, there shouldn't be a problem. But of course, I'm, again, I'm pretty sure that many of you in the audience will know that we do in fact have a problem and that problem is superbugs uh, as the common terminology is used now. That refers to bacteria and particularly bacterial pathogens that are resistant to multiple types of antibiotics. So antibiotics that directly kill bacteria. Now we have bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotics. So when we're, our immune system fails to clear a bacterial infection, now uh, we have a situation when you have a superbug infection that we don't have any treatments available for people with those infections. That alone uh, is worrying, but this is even more worrying because what you see here is in uh, my depiction of the antibiotic pipeline, okay? So this is the efforts from scientists uh, like myself or others, or Lily here, who's gonna talk next, um, and, uh, and industry trying to develop antibiotics, and there's not much coming out of the antibiotic pipeline, and there hasn't been for decades, to be honest. And the other issue, uh, not, to, not to put too bleak a picture on things, but the other issue is this timeline here, uh, which shows you that uh, examples of antibiotics that have been introduced into the clinic, and you can see in orange when antibiotics are introduced into the clinic, that in red is it the, the timeline when after introduction into the clinic, antibiotic resistance emerges. So an antibiotic is, um, um, goes into the clinic to treat bacterial infections, and then very soon after, antibiotic resistance emerges so that the antibiotic um, uh, loses its utility. Doesn't mean that it can't be used, it's still plenty of potential for it, but its utility in treating infectious disease is greatly reduced. So um, this diagram here depicts, uh, is my attempt to depict to you just how big a problem uh, this is going to be in the years to come. Um, so it's predicted that by 2050, there'll be 10 million deaths per annum from antibiotic resistant bacterial infections. Uh, to put that into some perspective, there's usually in the order of 60 million deaths globally every year. So 10 million of those from antibiotic resistant bacterial infections. That's the, the predict prediction overtaking uh, some of the known major killers like cancer that uh, are uh, obviously a, an ongoing and major problem. And you might think, well, that's three decades away. Possibly, there's not really that big a, an urgent need to worry just yet, is there? Actually, the problem is already here. So in 2019, um, an analysis was done to, uh, to I guess, try and uh, estimate the number of deaths globally attributed to antimicrobial resistant bacteria. And that estimate came out with 1.3 million deaths. So 
that the prediction is that if you had uh, one, if those bacteria were actually sensitive to antibiotics, there'd be 1.3 million less deaths in that year. And moreover, there was estimated to be 5 million deaths associated with antimicrobial resistant bacteria in the same year. So that means that if you didn't have that bacterial infection at all, there'd be 5 million less deaths. So again, to give you some perspective on that, that's 5 million deaths in, in one year associated with antibiotic resistant bacterial pathogens causing infectious disease. Uh, you'll all remember a little thing called COVID, uh, which came along in late 2019, early 2020, and it's been with us for almost three years now. The, I think the numbers are about six and a half to seven million deaths uh, total from COVID over that almost three years. So this is a really a major problem and an underappreciated problem. Of course, one of the, the issues with antimicrobial uh, resistance or antibiotic resistance is overuse of antibiotics. And that's a problem in Australia. More than 40% of Australians had at least one antibiotic dispensed to them in 2019, but it's a problem globally. And antibiotic resistant bacteria don't respect international borders. So uh, it, even if we were doing the right thing in Australia, it probably wouldn't, wouldn't matter so much on a global scale unless everyone is doing the right thing. So we have this issue of antibiotic resistance and it's a real challenge because there's not much coming out of the antibiotic pipeline. Our approach is to try and uh, think about, well, can we train the immune system as a way to fight superbugs? I just told you about the innate immune system that's very good, at, very good at protecting us from infection. Can we train it better to fight superbugs? And so that's the question I pose to you and the answer is yes, otherwise this would be a, a very short talk. And uh, I'm sure that you're familiar with, with vaccines that have uh, used to treat infectious or to prevent infectious diseases, sorry. And there are many effective vaccines that prevent uh, or limit the, the, the number of cases with various bacterial infections. Uh, so that's one very effective method by which we can train our immune system to fight superbugs by, by developing vaccines. But what happens if you already have an infection that needs to be treated and is untreatable with a superbug? So uh, I like to think that we can train our innate immune system to fight superbugs as an alternate approach to vaccines. And I've got this analogy here to try and demonstrate to, this to you. So what you see here is, uh, is the hallway in my house. So we, let's assume that's the, uh, a blood vessel, for example. And what you can see here is a nasty pathogen looking very, uh, very <laughs> troublesome. What you're about to see here is an innate immune cell, the macrophage, called into action to try and target this pathogen for destruction. And you can see that this is a very focused macrophage targeting the pathogen and ruthlessly destroying it. So uh, in my analogy here, we've got the innate immune system trying to fight the superbug. What, what our research is really trying to do is trying to speed up that macrophage and to make it much more potent at dealing with the superbug. And so a lot of our research is really focused on that sort of concept of enhancing the innate immune response to, okay. to out with the superbug. Sorry, I'm going again. I do need to point out this though, um, uh, to all of you that no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. And this is actually a direct quote from the lead participant. I'm a committed member of the Panthers and Doggers Union having campaigned actively for the minimum wag. It was completely my decision to take part in this video and the wildebeest had it coming to it. Now, I also need to point out that um, we, we were, my wife and I are quite good at, we were, uh, sadly, our, our little dog has passed on. She was 16 and a half when we took that movie, uh, very sad. Um, but we were quite good at training our dog to chase after squeaky toys and balls, but nothing else. Uh, so not very good at training our dog, but I like to think we're pretty good at training these cells macrophages, these key innate immune cells, the big eaters. So this is a picture of a macrophage here. As I said, these innate immune cells that are present in every tissue in our body. And in many, sense, many senses, these cells are, you know, this, one of the strengths of our immune system. They're constantly there defending us against infection. But in one way, they're also our greatest weakness. And that's because these are really long lived cells. So pathogens, these infectious agents that cause disease can actually target these cells and live in them. And many, many pathogens do that. They hide out in the macrophages to escape the immune system. So our, uh, I guess our uh, working model is that if you want to try and develop ways to boost the immune system to find infections, you're better at focusing on these weakest links and improving the weakest link. And so we do this in a number of ways. Uh, we're very interested in trying to understand exactly how macrophages kill bacteria, because when we understand how they kill bacteria, then we can work out strategies to enhance that response. And I just thought I'd give you a couple of very brief examples today. 
um, of some of the some of the sort of uh, weird and wacky things that we've discovered about macrophages. So this is one of them. So this is a human macrophage, and what you can see in blue is its nucleus. It's the, the brain center of the cell. And in green is a bacteria in the macrophage. So this macrophage has been infected. And in red is a signal uh, that the bacteria is experiencing. And what that tells us is that the bacteria in the macrophage is being subjected to toxic levels of zinc. And so what we found is that macrophages actually use zinc to kill bacteria. So they dump on toxic levels of zinc to the bacteria to toxify them. And so what our research is doing is developing approaches to enhance this response to enable macrophages to kill bacteria more effectively. Here's another wacky example. This is again an, a picture of a human macrophage inside a human macrophage. And what you can see here in blue are these rod-shaped bacteria. And in this case, these rod-shaped bacteria are being attacked by the macrophage by virtue of the fact that they're actually packaging up little globules of fat are called lipid droplets. And they, the macrophages are throwing these lipid droplets at the bacteria, and the lipid droplets are coated with all of these toxic molecules that are directly toxic to the bacteria. So that's, a, again, another example of how macrophages, um, when they encounter bacteria, can kill the bacteria. And again, what we, what we do is uh, figure out how we can turn on that pathway more effectively to kill the bacteria in the context of infectious disease. So uh, I do, do need to point out that beyond infectious disease, just one slide to point out that uh, our research is focused also in inflammatory diseases and macrophages are very important cells in the context of infection, but these cells uh, like our little dog uh, also can do with a bit more training uh, because although macrophages can be trained to kill bacteria, uh, they, they often get things wrong and they drive, macrophages are, are cells that drive chronic inflammation in chronic disease. So diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, neurodegenerative diseases, and many, many more. So we are also interested in trying to understand uh, how macrophages drive uh, chronic disease and then trying to suppress those responses. So other conditions that we're interested in are, for example, chronic liver disease, cystic fibrosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and rheumatoid arthritis, where we try to block the ability of macrophages to drive this inflammatory uh, state. So that's some of the research activities that are happening in my lab. Uh, and so we're trying to, I guess, cover a lot. And we really shouldn't leave things to me because if we do leave uh, these problems to me, we're in all sorts of trouble. So this is where I want to introduce our second set of global warriors beyond our innate immune system, which are our PhD students like Lily here, who's going to talk next. Uh, so at IMB, we have about 160 PhD students who are all uh, committed to um, unlocking knowledge and, and applying that knowledge. And last year at IMB, we started a new program for our PhD students, uh, which, um, as I said, just started last year, called the Global Challenges PhD, uh, PhD Scholarship. And uh, in this um, program, what we're trying to do is bring PhD students together to tackle a problem together, to collaborate. So uh, one, of the, one of the problems that we're trying to tackle um, is antimicrobial resistance, the problem that I've just, talk, just been talking about uh, that is antibiotic resistant bacterial infections. And so through teamwork and diverse approaches, we're getting our PhD students working on this problem, one single problem like antimicrobial resistance, but tackling the problem through different avenues. So for example, my research is about trying to train the immune system to kill bacteria. And one of my PhD students is using that approach, but other PhD students are using chemistry to de develop novel antibiotics, or using uh, molecular biology and microbiology to understand how bacteria evade antibiotics or to track uh, bacteria through um, uh, new technologies, et cetera. So our, our approach at the IMV is to, try and, is to try and use diverse approaches experimentally to tackle um, this one big problem. So that's just to uh, highlight that global warrior, our PhD student cohort. And then finally, I wanted to talk about another set of global warriors, which is all of you in the room. Um, and uh, uh, the title of this slide is the three P's of scientific research. And um, uh, for those of you who know anything about real estate will know that the, the three P's of real estate are position, position, position. Well, I like to think that scientific research also has its three P's. And in scientific research, it's the people, the people, the people. 
because science is is an amazing uh, game, if you like. It's a uh, a group of people, you know, uh, SJ just mentioned that we have about 500 people in this building who are all committed to unlocking new knowledge and applying that new knowledge in all sorts of ways. And it's it's an amazing and inspiring place to be in, but it's also an incredibly, uh, I guess, challenging environment. Uh, and that's partly because of the funding landscape that we all exist in. So in terms of the three Ps, this is, uh, this is my people. This is uh, the people in my lab who do all of the research that I'm incapable of doing. This is, uh, this is our lab uh, on a lab retreat recently where we actually escaped the IMB. And uh, this is them doing their very best supermodel impersonation here. Um, and, you know, my lab is uh, currently a team of about 10 people, but, um, you know, uh, labs around IMB are, are groups of different sizes and around Australia. And actually maintaining these groups of people to do research and to drive projects at a very long time, long, sorry, long term is often a very uh, challenging thing to do. Um, so, you know, Australian science needs dollars to keep it going. And at the moment, we're actually in a pretty, uh, I have to say it's a pretty uh, difficult time in Australian science because the, the grant funding rates uh, within Australian science through the major schemes are incredibly low, um, of the order of 10%. So one in 10 grants will, you know, will be funded on average for many of the, the schemes. Um, and so, uh, what I, I guess encourage all of you to be is global warriors. Um, I know you're all here today, so that says a lot about your interest in science, to really lobby, lobby federal and state MPs and anyone else who will listen about the importance of scientific research uh, and to keep the conversations going with others in the community about the importance of scientific research. Uh, and um, I guess one last point I want to leave you with is to, to really talk about the need to value discovery science, okay? so. Um, and by that, I mean discovering uh, fundamental aspects of science and not necessarily knowing what the applications of that science are. So we have been working on understanding how macrophages kill bacteria. We need to understand that before we could possibly apply it to trying to, to treat infectious disease. We need to understand the very fundamental basics of how things work. And so I like to think that today, today's discoveries in discovery science are going to deliver the solution to, to tomorrow's problems. And I just wanted to leave you with one last very specific example of that. So about 30 years ago, there was a famous immunologist in the US who used to work on a different cell type to me, T cells, which are, which are a different part of the immune system. And that immunologist uh, used, to, used to study these T cells and basically try to understand how they receive signals from the ex external environment and how they interpret those signals. That was his sole focus. He was trying to understand how those cells worked. He didn't have any intention to, to apply that to, in any way. He just wanted to understand how they work. The work from that researcher, Jim Allison, ultimately led to immunotherapy. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with immunotherapy uh, as now being used to treat many different cancers as one example, melanoma. So, you know, 10 years or more ago, stage four melanoma was a death sentence. It was almost no chance that anyone would survive beyond five years if you had stage four melanoma. Now there's about a 25% uh, survival rate for stage four melanoma out to five years and beyond, and it's likely to be up towards 50% in the years to come. So I just wanted to leave you with that as an example. Without the work of Jim Allison and others like him, 30 years before, we would never have immunotherapy now. And so the value of discovery science is something that comes decades later. So a final word from me before I um, pass back to SJ is, uh, I, I guess I haven't tried to talk too much detail about the research we've, we do uh, in my lab. I've just tried to give you a little snippet about some of the, the research that we do um, with the hope that that will keep you a little bit interested and maybe you want to find out more. And uh, I leave you with this last line. As my father always said, the first rule of theatre is to always leave them wanting more. A good man, but a terrible anaesthetist. <laughs> so, sorry about that. I always have to have one bad joke in my talk. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll pass back. Thank you so much, Matt. That was great. I like your joke at the end. That was very good. <laughs> okay. So 
Next up, we have Lily Kensington Evans. So Lily is a PhD candidate and a Global Challenges Scholar at IMB, trained in the fields of chemistry and microbiology. Lily recently joined the Blaskovich Lab, a group made up of chemists and microbiologists. So thank you for joining us, Lily, and sharing your current project work with us. She looks very different in um, with her new hairdo, by the way. It's an old photo. We must get that redone for you. <laughs> Hello, can you all hear me well? Perfect, brilliant. Alrighty. So, as Matt mentioned, I'm also going to be talking to you today about antimicrobial resistance and really where my PhD project comes in on that. But before I begin talking about it, I want to show just a cool image of something called a biofilm because when we think about bacteria infecting us, we sometimes think about them as these single cells, but for the most part, they actually form these pretty complex communities. And now this is what you usually look like, but it's something that I find intriguing and I think it relates to my story coming into science. So at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do is design super drugs to combat our super bugs because I am a chemist. Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. Um, so I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about my research career and how I came to be this global warrior. So. I've had a pretty varied research career. I actually came from a performing arts background uh, initially, but I found the creativity in science too good to miss. Um, so this was me in the Amazon doing some work on biodiversity and sustainability. And then I did some work in a parasitology lab. So parasites such as um, plasmodium that cause malaria. I also did some research into material science because I was trying to look at how to capture um, carbon dioxide in a form of sort of environmental sort of avenue. And then I have an award for my science communication and education. And that was presented by John Brumby, our Aero, the old Victorian premier. And lastly, to my research career at IMB at UQ. And I think my research career um, really culminates to this image because I heard about this Global Challenges Scholarship and I thought that's exactly what I want to be doing. I want to be helping the world in that way. Um, so just to reiterate what Matt Sweet already touched upon, antimicrobial resistance is one of the biggest threats to global health, food security and development today. And it is estimated that it will cause 10 million deaths um, per annum by 2050. And as we know, that estimate is pretty spot on given the 2019 statistic. So antibiotic resistance has arisen from a number of reasons, including the anthropogenic, so human use and misuse of these drugs, as well as intrinsic bacterial resistance factors. So that means that bacteria have a few different ways in their cells of breaking down our drugs or sending them back out. And it is going to have an economic and health burden that we need to address. But more importantly, we need to address that dwindling antibiotic pipeline. And that's where my research again comes in. So I understand that this may be a bit of a overwhelming slide, but I think I'll be able to talk you through it. So when we're talking about antibiotic resistance, we're not actually talking about our bodies that develops resistance. We're talking about the bacterial cells. So this pathogenic agent that's infected us, that's bypassed our innate immune system and is able to live and cause infection. So when we prescribe one of our drugs seen here, there's this, yeah, well, I'll just, sorry, get a laser up. There you go. Um, when we prescribe our drugs, bacteria have a few different ways of not only sending them back out of the cells, but breaking them down or simply altering them so they no longer work. The take home messages, there's multiple ways that bacteria destroy our drugs. On top of that though, most if not all pathogenic, so these disease causing agents, bacterial species form biofilms. Now biofilms are this community of microorganisms that are encased in a protective coating. So they don't just exist by themselves, they exist in this dense matrix. Now you may be familiar with biofilms through implants that become infected or catheter associated urinary tract infections, as well as diabetic ulcers that are hard to treat. They're all the result of biofilms that have been able to form and create this community in our body. And this is just another image of those biofilms, but we're taking a little bit of a step back. And I just wanted to show the beauty as well of these biofilms. They're quite fascinating. 
So really my question is for my PhD, can we join two antibiotics together to combat antimicrobial resistance? And the answer is yes, we can. I'm not the first person to come up with this idea, um, but I am doing it a little bit of a different way. And really my question then becomes combating antimicrobial resistance with these compounds called conjugates. So it's the design and synthesis of dual acting antimicrobials, because as I said, I'm a chemist. So we're gonna take a bit of a left field and I'm gonna give you a little chemistry lesson. I hope everybody's okay with that. It's uh, it'll be brief and I think you may learn something. So as a chemist, when I see the periodic table, I see building blocks and Lego blocks because that's what I use in the lab. And we really have that creativity to just take a compound and make it into something else or have a think about it. So this is pretty standard chemistry. We take A and we take B and we try and join them together. So is everybody following along? Yeah, and we form this new product. So this is just going to be our compound, let's say. For a real world example, we can show forming water. So we take hydrogen and we take oxygen and we make water. And if you can see, there's two red dots over on the product side and then two red dots over on the starting material side. We have four green dots and four green dots. Okay, so we're all comfortable with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can then take it to the next step, which is my research project. So this is four years worth of work in one slide. <laughs> um, but this is something called a copper catalyzed azide alkyne cycle addition reaction. You don't need to know that. You just need to know that I'm joining two antibiotics together. So the basis is we take one antibiotic, something like penicillin that you may have all taken, and we attach a little handle to it. We can then take another antibiotic, something like this, let's say, and attach another little handle to it. We can join those two antibiotics together using this little link over here. Um, the little handle that we attach, just for this sake of this talk, is N3, which then turns into the three ends over here in this new circle. Similarly, we take another red antibiotic, just as a generic one, and form it the other circle over here. And this is how we make our dual acting super drugs. So it's almost like a form of combination therapy, if you will. And this actually um, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2022, this type of chemistry using this type of reaction, the copper catalyzed reaction. And that's because it is really fascinating chemistry, which I won't go into now, but if you have any questions, more than happy to answer them later. Now I've told you that this type of uh, sort of chemistry works, but I guess I'll give you a real world example. This is not my own current research. This is from 2011. And this group were able to take a compound called ciprofloxacin, so just an antibiotic, regular, and another one called trimethoprim, and join them with this little linker. So it's not the same as the one I just showed you with those three ends, but they were able to show the you know, proof of concept that even when you co-administer these antibiotics by themselves, it doesn't work as well as when they're joined together. So this is what I'm really hoping to see with my compounds. So how do we go about choosing these antibiotics? You know, which ones do we have to attach our handles to? This is the question that I ask every day. And as a chemist, it's not as easy as taking the antibiotic and attaching the handle. Maybe sometimes we have to make some slight modifications. Hopefully we don't actually modify the parent antibiotic activity too much. We don't want it to stop working. Um, but we can make a few slight modifications. So for this one, We've turned this ring over here with a nitrogen and an oxygen into a nitrogen and a nitrogen. And this allows us to attach our N3 little moiety. So oh, I will just close that down. Just back to our representation of an antibiotic with an N3 handle. I'm also working on another type of antibiotic right now that I also um, won't show you it all, <laughs> you don't need to know. But again, it's that same idea of taking this parent sort of compound. We're not gonna modify this because we don't wanna lose the activity, but we can attach another antibiotic or a biofilm disrupting agent. And so the reason why we'd wanna attach a biofilm disrupting agent is because, as I mentioned before, these dense communities have a type of antibiotic resistance themselves. 
So the idea is we want to break down that community to allow our antibiotics to enter in. Now, again, I have an example of that. So this is taking an antibiotic called ciprofloxacin that we showed before that originally had no activity against biofilms. So somebody came in with, you know, a UTI, they were given ciprofloxacin and it doesn't work because perhaps there's been a biofilm that's formed. And then with a biofilm disrupting agent, the biofilm is able to break, uh, break down and the antibiotic is able to get into those cells. So this is really handy if we can uh, synthesize these drugs. And I'll bring you back to the biofilm slide because I think it's quite nice. <laughs> um, I really hope that I've shown you today that if successful, uh, the synthesis of these dual acting drugs will be able to restock our arsenal in the battle against antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. And that is mesmerizing that, that biofilm. Very, very pretty, but also a bit disturbing. Um, kind of like an alien. Um, so thank you so much, Lily. Next we have Dr. Nicholas Condon. So Dr. Condon is a Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Imaging Scientist and a senior mi microscopist, so hard to say, <laughs> um, in, our, uh, in the Institute's um, microscopy core facility. So in his role, Nicholas works collaboratively collaboratively with our researchers on the cutting edge microscopes housed in the core facility and helps them create custom tools to process and analyze the images and movies captured on these devices. So thanks, Nick, for sharing your presentation with us. And I'll just get you to stand here if that's okay. Yep. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I thought I'd start this talk with a little bit about me. Um, basically, I've started my research career at UQ and stayed here because I think we have some of the best technology, the best people, and the best environment for science. I did a Bachelor of Biomedical Science, which is my undergrad with honours back in 2011 in Professor Jenny Stowe's lab, working on the kind of interface between cell biology and microbiology. So I, I was looking at how salmonella would enter into those immune cells that Matt was talking about called macrophages. And then I did a PhD and a number of years later, again in Jenny's lab, but this time looking at more on the cell side, how the cell was reacting and what was you know, happening during infection or in the uh, leading up to infection. And I uh, basically did a lot of microscopy in my PhD. And now I'm doing uh, my fellowship as a Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Imaging Scientist. And that's a five year program that I've, uh, or grant that I secured to solve some of the big data. And I'll talk to you about how the microscopes are getting more advanced and how they're making more data. And your classic biologists, some of the people on Matt's slide perhaps, don't really know how to deal with terabytes of data. and you know, how to process, transfer, manage, and all that. So to take you back to my honors, I was infecting macrophages with the salmonella, and the lab hadn't done that before, so I had to you know, work out from the literature what was happening and how to do it, and how many, how many bacteria to put on per cell and things like that. And it involved lots of counting. So, you know, cell one has five bacteria, three are inside, two are outside. And that got really old really quickly because there was hundreds and hundreds of images. So it sparked my interest in going, well, maybe we can use the computer programs to count the bacteria. And how would we go about that in image analysis? And I had a number of uh, really good postdoctoral and group leader mentors. And one of them took me to the confocal and we did live bacterial infections and we could see a cell getting infected in real time. And that really sparked my interest for complex microscopy. Then during my PhD, as I said, I looked at the cells side of things and macrophages, these immune cells, this is what one of them looks like here. It's quite pretty. And when it was tickled with a bit of an infectious agent, it had this response where it made this big ruffle on the cell surface. And macrophages are really dynamic cells. They have to be. Matt showed the video of them crawling along, surveilling, looking for things. Well, they turn over their membrane every half an hour. And so this is a movie I captured during my PhD where the cells are ruffling and sampling their environment. And I've made the time appear as color. And all of that colored motion 
represents only five minutes of what the cell's doing. And so previously, if we couldn't capture you know, every second, we wouldn't see all that information happening. And so uh, these drastic changes that occur in this still, it's really not the, quite the whole picture when you look at everything that's happening in only five minutes. So I used these microscopes to screen which proteins are involved in making these structures. And I got to travel to the United States to use a prototype instrument that had only been invented the year before and published the year before uh, to identify a new way of how the cells are sampling their environment to find these pathogenic markers. So here's a, a younger version of me where I went to the US and that's the prototype instrument. And when I say prototype, I mean, hacksaw cut pieces of PVC pipe to hold it together prototype instrument. And this was invented by a Nobel Prize winner. And I got to meet and have mentor sessions with them over two weeks. And I produced 35 terabytes of data. And that took, you know, two years to process it before we could publish it. So we had this result sitting on the hard drives for two years. And that publication finally came out in 2018. And this is the video from it, one of the videos, where we identified a new way that the cells drink and sample their environment. And that is recognized as the top five of all publications and uh, number seven of all time from the journal in having an impact in the field. Now I'm working on solving the big data bottlenecks. So as I said, we came back with 35 terabytes, but we can produce about 10 terabytes a day now in our facility. And so we're churning out data left, right and center. We don't want to see it left on the hard drive. We want to see it published. And to be able to do that, we have to work collaborative, collaboratively with all these people around the world and around Australia to create tools, to process, analyze and share the data. It's all well and good that we can capture it and then look at it, but we have to be able to share it with the research community. So I'm creating solutions to deal with these multi terabyte data sets that are coming from the microscopes and that involves creating tools to deal with high performance compute clusters and you know, command line back in the days of DOS. It's not really something that's taught in undergrad anymore. Um, and ensuring that the data is accessible from anywhere. So it's all well and good to go and meet with a collaborator, but unless you're dragging hard drives with you, that data is not backed up. The student might you know, leave it on a train or something. Now all that data is kept inside safe and secure and is accessible anywhere. And we mean anywhere. Um, and, you know, training workshops, making content for our, um, you know, scientists here and our future scientists. I've had lots of great opportunities as well in this uh, fellowship. I get to travel around nationally and internationally to work with colleagues. I was recently down in Sydney. Uh, they purchased a mic or two microscopes that have eight cameras in total and are producing terabytes a day. And so they're leaning on the technology that we're creating here at IMB to you know, roll out and support their research. I get to create globally recognized workshops. So all of our content that we create in our facility is uh, recommended and endorsed by Global Bioimaging. And I get to work on really amazing and fun collaborative projects all around uh, IMB and UQ. So these are some images from a researcher at UQ who was uh, having looking at animal vision. And we used our tools and our compute power that we have here to basically speed up their workflow about a thousand times. And I get to do other fun stuff. Uh, this was Brisbane Festival where we worked with uh, the, the, some of the artists to take the microscopy images and represent it in, in the, uh, and in the art installation. But here at the IMB, we have a core facility. Welcome to take anyone on the tour this afternoon and show you. We have about 22 advanced microscopes and we support about 200 odd users. And we provide the technology and expertise to you know, support the cutting edge research programs that are going on here. And we are recognized both nationally and globally as a leading facility. I'm only one person. There is three of us who actually work in the core. You may have seen a microscope. You may have used a microscope in high school. This is what ours look like. They're probably a little bit more complicated. Um, but, you know, we have lots of different researchers here. We've got chemists. We've got cell biologists. We've got microbiologists. We have to support all of the researchers here. So we have a wide variety of equipment and capabilities. So we can image from about a centimeter 
that's what we call small, but then right down to really small, so about 30 nanometers. So we sit in this kind of range here. How do we actually see what we're looking at? So I showed you a cell before that was green. That's using a protein called GFP, it comes from a deep sea jellyfish. A number of years ago, it was the protein was isolated and we can then label all of our things that we're interested in with that. Thankfully, we all also moved on from just having green. We have a lot of colors of the rainbow now and we can label lipids and sugars and all different things. And um, these multiple labels let us capture these stunning images where we can look at a cell and we can see its surface that's labeled in pink. We can see its nuclei in white. We can see all the little endosomes and balloons in the cell that it's sampling and taking up stuff. Now we have, as I said, a wide variety of equipment, wide variety of researchers. This is what some of the stuff we can do and capture here. So this is a caterpillar, it's a cross section down the middle and we can see it's muscles and it's uh, stomach. And this was a caterpillar that was eating a plant that was producing a toxin that would only kill the caterpillar. And we could see that inside. Now, you guys don't really have to deal with the chemical companies that we deal with, but I can guarantee you there are not many caterpillar antibodies down at the you know, molecular bunnings. So with tools that we have, we can see all these labels and things with you know, non-conventional methods. We also have people working on Sea elegans, which are like a tiny worm. We have zebrafish biologists. So this is a tiny fish that you might see at pet barn or something. But um, here they've labeled its blood vessels in, in the brain and are imaging it. And this is a quail and it's just developing and we can see the neural cord here. We also have lots of cell biologists. So we have single cells that we look at or fields of cells and how the cells are interacting. We have whole tissues and we do a lot of kind of strange side projects like this is a, a section of a human tooth where we were working with a dentist to quantify the uh, these little tiny holes or the nerve holes and we have um, different levels of collagen in the tissue so this was a external researcher captured a bunch of or had a bunch of samples had a research question and found out you know how uh, the changes in collagen affect the breakdown of teeth we can also look at uh a method called super resolution or breaking the optical limits. So we can see high detail images of cells and the structures in it. This is a nucleus and the nucleus Matt kind of alluded to before is the important part of the cell with all the DNA and the instructions. Well, that has to come out of the nucleus at some point so that it's red so that it can make the genes. This movie in the middle it's playing is using a method that we have called STED microscopy. And that lets us get down to really high resolution. So a normal microscope would see, you know, the before and the after sees all this extra detail. And that's the extra detail is where the answers to these problems can be found. We also have bacteria here. Now bacteria are really tiny. Most of the images that were shown are all stylized, lovely artist drawings, but these are actual bacteria where we can see structures inside them. So we see really high resolution detail. We can also image over time and see how things are developing. So Matt was talking about blood vessels. This is a fish that's growing and we can see its blood vessels forming at the kind of macro level. But we can also look in high detail at a single blood vessel and how the cells are joining up together to you know, look at how the immune cells might crawl out and escape through the gaps or how the cells uh, form in it to make this structure. We also image cell death. So here we have a number of cells and we can see the kind of low resolution. When they all pop and explode, they turn green. But we can also use high resolution, high speed microscopy to look at the cells when they die. And we can see when this one, these ones are going to explode and turn purple. We can see what's happening and how that process is occurring because this is important because sometimes the bacteria actually kill the cells and then flood out. So understanding how these processes occur is really good or cutting edge discovery science. Now, Matt was showing some, talking about phagocytosis, the big eaters. Well, this is a video that I captured of a macrophage actually reaching out and eating something. So that's, it's, it's rendered, but it, it, that is from real data. That's actually what's happening. And we can look at that not only at one little event, but we can have a whole field of cells now, I have gone a little bit Michael Bay with my, you know, video editing skills here, but you can see 
the cell reaching out and grabbing it. And we can see the structures in that. And understanding how the cells form these things leads to new research questions and new uh, you know, possible therapeutic targets or things like that. Now, the problem is those images take a lot of processing. So we can use one technique called deconvolution where we can enhance the contrast. And why we might want to do that is you've probably heard of this thing called machine learning. Now, the machines, to be honest, are not that smart yet. They need a bit of help. So telling it where to find objects in the left pane versus the right pane, it's going to always do a better job on the you know, processed image there. And we can, we can use these machine learning tools to find the cells. Now, how that works in kind of a research question is someone like Matt or Matt's students might have a field of view of cells like this, and they want to count bacteria in it. Now, this is quite hard to find the cells individually because they're all different shapes. They're really different and unique. And so we can use these tools to process it and segment them automatically. But that becomes really, really hard when you have terabytes of data. So you can have a really good computer. You might go to JB Hi-Fi, and this was yesterday with the best available gaming PC. It's on sale at the moment. I wouldn't recommend buying it, but you know it has these kind of specs. You know, it's a it's a powerful computer, but the university has an even more powerful computer, being a supercomputer, where it has you know thirty two of these kind of things all strapped together. It's about the size of a fridge, and it has a petabyte of storage on it, and it has you know, 12 terabytes of RAM. If you've got the latest iPhone, you might only have about 12 gigabytes. So this is a thousand times more processing power. But these computers are, you know, while really powerful, they're not easy to use. They don't have a keyboard, they don't have a screen, you can't walk up to them. So you have to use command line, but benefit of it is you could probably only have one person using this, but you can have lots of people using this at the same time. But it runs on text-based command line, which most biologists, myself included, are not very good at. So I've created a tool or designed a tool where we can make a website where the users or the, the, the microscopy users in the building log in, say, I want to do this, this, and this, and then click go, and it spits out their job for them automatically. They don't have to worry about command line. We give them a nice, pretty interface. And so it lets them do all these kind of relatively mundane tasks, but what would used to take hours and hours, they can just let the computer do it for them and send it off to the computer uh, to the queue and then it runs when it's their turn. But this has seen a like a, an actual 10 times reduction in the processing time because we've scaled up to big you know multiple computers. And we have a four times reduction in the amount of steps that you have to deal with the data. So instead of going file open, wait half an hour. Now do this, wait half an hour do this or 10 minutes. You can only do it in about two or three clicks now and you get your result emailed to you. Now, I'm a microscopist. I've shown you a bunch of pictures. We also have a wide variety of things that we get to do, uh, you know, my other hats in the facility. So we have a 3D printer because we have to, to be at the cutting edge. Someone might have unique devices. We're working with uh, the Blaskovich group where they have these custom microfluidic things that they're making. No microscope vendor, you can't go to Zeiss and say, oh, here's my thing, will it fit? So we have a you know, printer to create the different custom inserts. We worked with the, one of the labs doing COVID research where they wanted to uh, have blood vessels in the COVID incubator to do their research, but they had to rock back and forth to keep the vessel wet. But unfortunately, you know, a plate rocker usually is about this big and they cost a lot of money and they don't really survive an autoclave. So we had to create a disposable thing, and we did that in about two weeks and rapidly prototyped it. This is a very uh, organic quail uh, incubator that we made where we had to keep the little eggs warm while we're imaging them. We create, we use VR as well to support the data processing and data visualization, and we create lots of custom software and tools to quantify the data. So here we have some muscle fibers where we're using machine learning to find the cells and then processing them. Or we have, you know, drug targets and things like that affecting cells and scripts running to process the data. So in conclusion, um, scholarship and opportunities that have been presented to myself uh, at IMB has really enabled me to be, uh, you know, 
world leading imaging scientist and producing global tools and trainings that's benefiting everyone in the microscopy community. Uh, the microscopes are getting more complicated, but don't you worry about that. We, we, we'll have to deal with that. But it's producing more data and we're needing more resources to support this, whether it's bigger compute, whether it's, you know, developers to create tools or, you know, just ways to support the science. But I'm incredibly lucky because no two days are the same. And I get to work with a bunch of incredible people. I get to be the first in the world to see things when I look down the microscope. And, you know, we get to support the world-class science by making innovative solutions where I one day might be coming in and designing a 3D printed file or getting an esky and shoving uh, heating parts into it for something, you know, it's, it's, it's just fun. So the IMB is a very great place to work with great people. I'm only one of them involved in these projects. And uh, these are all the extra people. So I'm happy to take questions. And I think the other um, panelists will as well. Thank you, Nick. So it's been a great set of presentations. We've heard about super bugs, super drugs, and super computers. So uh, we're getting the whole spectrum, which is fantastic. So what I'm going to do now is I'll stop sharing the screen and I'll invite our three panelists to please sit down the front here. Look in this one to the front screen. And I'm just going to readjust our camera. Zoom out a bit so we can see our three panelists. Now, if anyone is online and you have a question, there is a Q&A tab down the bottom of the screen there. So please use the Q&A tab to, um, to write, submit your question. And then, of course, in the room, you can also um, just simply raise your hand if you have a question. So we might start in the room. Uh, does anyone have a question to begin with? Yes, over here. Start here. It's there. Lonnie, I think you mentioned that the conventional wisdom is that when we're prescribed antibiotic, we should finish the course in order to minimize antibiotic resistance. So even if our symptoms disappear or get better. But I've read an article questioning that. Uh, have you heard any more about is that still the recommendation? And, you know. That's a very good question. Um, but yes, you should always finish your course of antibiotics because as, and it actually ties well into Matt's work. So. A bacteria infects us and we get ill. And usually our immune system is pretty good at clearing that infection, but sometimes it's able to bypass the macrophage and it creates a disease. When we take our antibiotics, it's a way of helping the immune system. So we need to kill, we need to kill all those bad bacteria. But the thing is, there's usually maybe one or two that survive. So we want to make sure that we take all our antibiotics so we kill as many as we can. And that way our immune system can maybe kill the one or two that last but yeah, you need to take them all, yeah. Again in the room, yes, Paulina. Thank you for your wonderful talks. Um, I have a question from Matt and Lily. I was wondering if it's possible to conjugate like uh, an antibiotic and a, an immune modulation drug together, whether that would help fight in fighting the bacteria and maybe overcome the problem of it becoming resistant to that kind of treatment, whether that kind of research has been done already? Who would like to answer this? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, Lily mentioned adjuvants, which are a way of um, priming the immune system to, so adjuvants are components we add to vaccines to make the immune system more effective at killing bacteria, but I guess specifically to your question, yeah, I think there is interest in trying to develop ways where we have basically dual targeting where you might uh, boost the, the you know, immune antimicrobial response, but also have a direct antimicrobial effect. Uh, I mentioned those, the lipid droplets, these globules of fat, and uh, I've actually talked with people in the building about that as a possibility where you actually could incorporate the, these uh, lipid droplets can accumulate molecules that you could actually use that as a strategy of targeting antibiotics through lipid droplets to intracellular bacteria. So that would be one approach. It would be, I mean, by targeting an antibiotic directly to the lipid droplet to basically uh, more effectively target the bacteria would be one strategy. Actually, um, related to that, what we have been doing is using 
an approach, not quite the same, but actually using a molecule that both, both um, boosts the immune response to actually kill bacteria more effectively, but also at the same time dampening uh, inflammation that um, is also a problem when you have a severe infection like in sepsis where the inflammatory response is out of control and that's what ends up killing you. So we're trying to do both things with one molecule by boosting the ability to kill the bacteria, but also turning off the inflammation that's doing us harm at the same time. Yes, I would I agree to that. Um, yeah, so yeah, adjuvants, I guess, is one way of doing that. Um, the big question as a chemist that arises for me is, well, how do I join them together? Because that's the really tricky part. And then once I've joined them together, do I want to keep them together? So maybe I do when it comes into a, you know, to the terms of a macrophage and something like salmonella that is able to um, enter into that cell. When it enters into the cell, that, that new drug that I've made, do I want them to go to separate targets? Do I want that linker that's joined them together to actually break down? Or do I want them to stay together? And yeah, that's, I mean, you, you could pretty much do anything. That's the fun part about chemistry, but whether it would go into the right places is the next thing. Hmm. Any questions online? No, nah. we'll stick to the room then. Thank you, all three of you. It's amazing to listen to you all. It's an incredible work you're doing. Um, I wanted to ask um, Lily, with you mentioned that joining them together is more effective than just taking the two separately. I was just wondering if you could explain why that is, um, please. <laughs> Yeah, it's, well, it's very fascinating. So it's always really exciting to see those um, results. And I haven't seen that yet. Um, so the reason is you are taking two known antibiotics and we know where those antibiotics work. We know that the site that they're going to, to kill the bacteria. But when we join them together, technically we're creating a new type of antibiotic because we've changed the sort of properties or what it looks like. So in a few cases, it's hypothesized that there's probably a new target. So there's a whole new way of it killing bacteria, which is kind of handy because one of the reasons why we see resistance is that bacteria get used to how it kills them. So they know how to block it. Um, so that's one such way. Another reason is due to, sorry, what was your question? The, why you have improved? Yeah. Um, another way is, Bacteria are really, really, really small, and they have a limited amount of energy. When we give them one antibiotic, they break it down in one way. When we give them a different type of antibiotic, they break it down in a different way. When we give them two, they have to decide which one they're going to break down first. And so that's one of the big things when it comes to antibiotics, and Matt mentioned this. We can still use them. You know, they haven't stop working per se it's just that bacteria are really good uh, they can um you know respond quicker than we can deliver so when you give two at once they have to think about how they're going to spend their energy yeah hi thanks very much that was uh, fascinating i just want to ask a question about data if, if that's okay uh, it was also fascinating hearing about submitting command line jobs to computers it's like going back 50 years it's um, I understand uh, about creating the data and making it available to people. I just wondered where commercialization of that data and IP comes into that and how, how UQ can protect anything that it, I, I know you're off, often working for, for clients. How, how do you protect uh, uh, the university's interest in the commercialization of that, uh, those discoveries? So, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, Back when I came back with the 35 terabytes and I was, you know, one of the few people at the university making a lot of data, we formed a committee um, with a number of people who were kind of in this boat where we were seeing the trajectory going, we're going to make all this, this you know, it's going to be a problem very soon. So the university has invested in significant data storage where we have siloed um, collections of data. So you know, Matt might have five of these for five different projects he's working on. If we have a commercial person come in, then everything sits in one collection. And that's 
um, maintained. Now that collection can be shared. It can be shared within the university and outside. And the, um, you know, as, as far as like IP, that's usually down to the individual project, whether it's an open project or if it is for commercial purposes. Um, but all of that's kind of managed at that level. We are creating data and sharing it. One of the ways we can do that is using these collections of data as an S3 bucket. And so the data never leaves UQ. It's just people outside are accessing it in a controlled way. So that we have we have tools and mechanisms in place to uh, manage and deal with that. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. So cloud computing, I mean, the data storage in the cloud, if you like. Sorry. That's that's the new term is the edge cloud, where it's our own UQ cloud. Um, there is Amazon, there is Microsoft Azure, all these different products, but it's getting terabytes there, getting terabytes back, paying the costs to store it there versus maintaining it ourselves. So a, a lot of it is we have the university has its own supercomputers. That was only one of about three that I showed and spoke about. Um, they all have different makeups, but it's, yeah, we do it all in-house mostly, yeah. And another question? Very briefly, uh, uh, viral, viral infections as uh, distinct from bacterial. Yeah. Oh, sorry, did you want to? We can both oh, we, do we, it. Yeah, we can take you go first. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I most recently learned about this. Um, it's a really good question. So there are a few different types of pathogenic agents. We have viruses, bacteria, parasites, and fungi. And the difference between bacteria and viruses are their, I guess their, their makeup. So the type of cells that they are. Um, viruses are unable to replicate by themselves. So they need to, yes, come into our own cells and use our machinery. Bacteria, on the other hand, they are able to replicate on their own. Um, both are really just as bad as the other. Both cause some really serious diseases. Um, so is that the, would you like to know how, how they differ at the end of the day or yeah. <laughs> yeah. would you like to add? Yeah, I can add something to it. Yeah, I mean, and I guess uh, just in terms of how our immune system deals with, with bacteria and viruses and other pathogens, um, there are different arms of our immune system that operate in different ways. And our immune system generally works by understanding where a pathogen is. So as Lily said, some bacteria live outside and our immune system will respond to bacteria that live outside cells in a different way because they can directly access the bacteria. The immune system can use antibodies, for example, to target the extracellular bacteria. Whereas if there's bacteria inside the cell, then a different part of the immune response is required. And it's the same with, with viruses. Viruses actually replicate within the cytoplasm of a cell. So we need a very specific immune response to deal with, with viral infections. And so actually when we are thinking about um, trying to develop approaches to, for example, um, manipulate immune responses to kill bacterial pathogens, then we absolutely need to think about what does that do to responses against viruses? Because we need to you know, be sure that whatever approach we're using might be boosting in a, a response against bacteria, but we need to make sure that we're not actually uh, compromising part of the immune response that would help us defend against viruses, particularly when, um, you know, for example, obviously often we have a viral infection and that will uh, predispose then to getting a secondary bacterial infection. That's a very common thing when you have a, a respiratory virus, for example. So we, we can't consider these things in isolation for sure. Any more questions in the room? Yeah. Uh, this one's for Nicholas. Um, in microscopy, traditionally at high magnification, one of the limitations is very limited depth of field. So for a very thick sample, it's out of focus. But I understand now there are really good techniques for getting really good depth of field. So has that now become quite standard and not a problem? Yeah, so the the it's an excellent question. Um, recently in the field, a lot of developments happened in what's called light sheet microscopy. So usually we would have a sample, 
like a cell, and it's kind of like a fried egg. We'd have an objective above it, and we would look down through it, and then we would get an image back. But we relied on the optics of that objective to have a very thin optical section, because we want to have a thin section, no out of focus light, it's nice and sharp, contrast, you know, it, it's high resolution. But what the, you know, the limitation is you rely on optics and they can get very expensive, they can't be miniaturized. We have, you know, it's a challenge. So with Lightsheet, we disconnect the excitation and the detection. So what we what I mean by that is we have an objective shining a thin sheet of light through the sample, and then we look with a second one. And when we do that, we can have different physics means that we can manipulate the sheet size and thickness and things like that. And we have some of those instruments here. Um, they create a new problem because they run faster because you no longer have to move the big heavy objective. You can just use um, mirrors and things to move the whole sheet of light up and down. So then you, you know, the, the biologist will say, well, well, if I can take uh, three times the size volume of images, then I will. And, <laughs> and they don't think about the three times the data. <laughs> and then you can switch <laughs> channels faster with that method. So then you have, you know, two or three colors. So then you have two or three times the data there. And then you have bigger camera sizes because you can light up the whole fish in one plane. And so um, while it solves the high res resolution problem, it creates many more problems. So, yeah. We have one of the instruments I'll show on the tour if you have time to come up. Uh, I want you to forgive me for asking a personal question for each of you, which is how do you resist the headhunting of that world out there that we all fear? Um, kind of centered in America, I suppose, where um, people like yourselves are seen as being, you know, profit producing people. What is it that keeps you here in your job here? Um, and presumably you are approached by people. So what is it that keeps you here? Uh, where you, what is it in your job? We'll go along the line if you like. Well, I think I can answer that quite easily because, and I'll have to admit my age, I'm, I've only just turned 24, so I haven't actually experienced that side of it yet. <laughs> and I've only just started, you know, my research career. I'm only um seven months into my PhD. So what keeps me and what brought me to IMB was the facilities, um, the lab, particularly the Blaskovich lab. So the fact that we have chemists and microbiologists in one lab is incredibly rare. I, I actually don't know of any other labs sort of off the top of my head that I could list. Um, the environment, the fact that there are other PhD students, it's really valuable to be able to do research as a PhD in an institute um, with the focus on that research and be able to be with like-minded students. Um, but yeah, I'm sure that they'll I'll be headhunted to a degree at some point. <laughs> yeah, I think, does that answer your question? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I would say I, I started my lab here at IMB in 2007, so 15 years ago. So I've had a lab for 15 years. And I, I guess, you know, we all have different motivations, right? My, I, my biggest motivation is actually the people in my lab. Um, they really do, you know, constantly inspire me and uh, amaze me. And so I've... Uh, I've never, since having my lab, really had a, um, uh, a thirst to leave, to be honest, because I'm just, I really love the environment of, of my lab and the, the work they're doing. Uh, and, you know, I think people, a lot of people in academic research, you know, really what, what keeps us going is just, you know, discovery, finding things out, often <laughs> without really knowing why that's important sometimes, but, uh, but finding, you know, applying that down the track. And uh, you know, for me, that's that's really motivation enough. It's an amazing environment here at IMB and at, at the University of Queensland as well. So, yep, that's me. Um, well, I already kind of said that in my talk, where I said, uh, you know, it's a great place to work, and no two days are the same. I get to make these awesome observations that you know no one else in the world has seen before every day. So that's quite exciting. And we also, as a core facility. 
um, you know, kind of pride ourselves a bit on having institutional knowledge. So Matt might have a PhD student, or, you know, Lily might come and do some imaging work and then she's going to go off and get a job somewhere. And Mark, her group leader, or you know, Matt might come to us and say, how did we do that again? We want to repeat that. Or, you know, because they're not, the group leaders aren't directly involved in the everyday nitty gritty of the project. So we, we know about how this method was done, what was used, what, how we did it, what was that trick that we had to do to get it to work? Um, because there's, as I said, we have 22 instruments and each of those might have six objectives and, you know, 10 different lasers and colors and things. So knowing which tool is the right thing is important. And I think, you know, valuable in, in, in why I stay here. So. Okay. Any last questions? If there's not, I'm just going to ask our final question. I know we've got a school student up the back and we sometimes get young people tuning in online as well. And I just wanted to know if you have any career advice for someone who's a bit younger, thinking about a career in science, thinking of doing science at university. Um, I think have a broad perspective because at the end of the day, science is about discovery of the unknown, but discovery of the world. And as we've also just seen here, we're facing global challenges. So I think you know, maintain broad interests. And something that I would say from my own personal journey is science communication, because at the end of the day, we're publicly funded. Um, so we have an ethical and a moral obligation to the public to share that knowledge. So I think anybody going into science should absolutely hone their science communication skills. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> I'll keep working. <laughs> um, I'm not sure about actually directly answering the question here, but uh, I did. Well, your question did sort of trick my mind to reflect on a couple a few years ago. I, um, my lab went on a, a small retreat, and I asked everyone in the lab at the very beginning of the retreat, you know, why did you go into to research into scientific research? Uh, and every single person, including myself. Uh, and we went around and said it was because I had a teacher at school that inspired me in science. It was like 100% of people. It was amazing. And uh, so I just think that um, the students that are doing science, if you're inspired by, by science, go for it because it really it keeps, um, keeps all of us ticking over. So, yeah. Um, no, I guess my advice to students, and that is definitely keep an open mind. I was the first person in my family to go to university. And... I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. If I look back at my course history, it was dabbling in a bit of microscopy, a bit of microbiology, a bit of cell biology, maybe chemistry. And then, you know, it's come full circle. And now I deal with all of those things every day. So just keeping an open mind is the, the key thing, I think. You don't know where you'll end up. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'll also mention on that topic, um, we have Dr. Dale Owens here today. She's up the back. She's our science teacher in residence at IMB, and she's actually creating some resources for us um, for students and teachers that will be available online. So watch this space. Uh, next year, you should see some of those appear. So what we're going to do now is just finish off our presentation. You can take a seat back in the audience now. Thank you so much. I'll share my screen again. and just go down to the end here. And I just wanted to share with you um, some of the ways that you can actually support IMB. Go forward one slide. There we go. So I can say hand on heart, our researchers here really genuinely are so grateful for all community support. Oh, thank you. I have to just move my camera because I can't see that on myself. <laughs> Can you see me yet, Shona? No. Is it zooming out? Oh, yes. I just tilt. Yeah, thank you if you can find us. So I'll just talk you through our, our slide here. So there's many ways you can help. Um, 
as someone in the community. So the first uh, and easiest free way that you can help our scientists is to follow us on social media. So every time you like or you share one of our posts, uh, that helps us to spread our message even further. So it's a free way to spread our latest news. We also have a great online newsletter. So if you would like to sign up to that, they'll, there's in your bags that we're giving you today in the room, there's a feedback form there, but I'll also put a QR um, code on the screen and you can sign up digitally if you like as well. So that's where we'll ask you for feedback on today's session, but um, optional, you can also sign up for the newsletter. We also have a great citizen science project and it fits in very well with the theme today and that is Soils for Science. So if you haven't heard of Soils for Science before, it is where we are asking Australians to send in small samples of dirt from their backyard to our scientists here at IMB and they're on the hunt for new antibiotic leads that could possibly be found in the soil from your backyard. It's a fantastic project. All the information's on our website or um, you can go to soils for, uh, soilsforscience.org.au. So you can go that way or you can go through our web page and find the Soils for Science page. It's a great free initiative. So it, it costs you nothing to get involved. You can ask your family and friends to get involved. Uh, we send you the kit and you even get a, a free little shovel as well that you can keep in your garden. Now, if we find something exciting in your backyard, yard. Uh, I like everyone to know we're not going to come back with a bulldozer or anything like that. We don't need any more soil. Uh, that small amount is all we need to keep it growing forever, those microbes. So uh, it's also a really great way to get young people interested in the world of microbes. Uh, if you're interested in um, having a free tour, if you belong to a community group, or if you would like to have a guest speaker to come out, um, I'm available as a guest speaker and I can do an overview of our IMB research, but I also have a team of ambassadors that can come with me as well. So if you want to get a more scientific uh, perspective as part of that talk, we can come out and deliver those for free. And then, of course, the most amazing way that people can make a donation, uh, to make a difference is to make a donation. There are two things i like you to know about that. One is that 100% of the money you give to IMB goes directly to the research. I think that's really important to know. And the second thing I want you to know is you do have the ability to direct where you would like that money to go. So if you've heard something today, for example, that has inspired you, maybe it's um, antimicrobial resistance or supporting the microscopy team who support all the researchers, or maybe you're really interested in the um, uh, the Global Challenges Scholarship supporting those, you can actually direct your money into a, a specific area. So you can talk to uh, Ken up the back, um, who's there in the back row, or myself today, if you'd like to know any more about donations. And I just have a little video to show you about the Director's Circle. So our Director's Circle members are people who have donated more than $1,000 in one year. So they are so valuable to us, our Director's Circle members, and I've just got this great video that I can play. Uh, before we sign off today. Scientific discovery and collaboration are the key to a better future. At the Institute for Molecular Bioscience, more than 500 staff work across disciplines and through extensive international networks in order to improve outcomes in health, agriculture and sustainable futures. The contributions of our philanthropic donors allows us to continuously advance our work improving outcomes in health and disease and to finding sustainable solutions for our cities, fuels and foods. Our research is inspired by nature. We maintain the largest collection of venoms in the world, which we use to develop environmentally friendly insecticides and life-saving human therapeutics. I feel enormously privileged to be part of the Director's Circle. This wonderful group of philanthropists are funding the next bout of amazing scientific ideas and progress, and it's really wonderful to be a part of that and to be um, so closely aligned and, and enhancing the outcomes of the Institute. So last year, thanks to funding, I was able to present my research at an international, highly regarded conference. At the conference, I was able to not just present my research, but get feedback from international researchers from all around the world and forge new collaborations. And this has really been key to my career development. And none of this would have been possible without the generosity of my donors. We do have friends with serious health problems. If we can see some tangible results for them in our lifetime, then that's what we'd like to see. The whole purpose of our contribution is to help society. By helping IMB, we can help society. Special interest would be into um, 
dementia. Uh, my mother had dementia. It's still there that you remember it and you can feel for pe other people who also are facing those problems with their parents. Through philanthropic donations such as the Ulgebra Alzheimer's Researcher Program, I was able to pursue my PhD uh, over here in IMB, uh, the leading research institute in Australia, and was able to study uh, Alzheimer's disease and inflammation. I hope the impact of my philanthropy is twofold. Uh, firstly, I want to see fantastic science at IMB um, performed, really blue sky research that's not um, able to be funded through the traditional mechanisms. Two, I want to see uh, all of the fabulous women at IMB succeed in their career goals uh, and to overcome the barriers to their career progression and prosper so that we have uh, eventually uh, full participation of women at the senior levels at IMB. Well, fortunately, we have met some of the researchers involved and it's always great to meet those people who are, who are doing that fantastic work. And, and just as fortunately, we have met some of the, the families of people who have benefited from the research we have supported in the past. So it's a real privilege and quite humbling to just step inside their lives for a couple of minutes and, and understand how important this research can be to their lives. Funding from private donors, UQ alumni and the lot has greatly accelerated our research aimed at developing game-changing drugs to treat stroke and heart attack and to increase the pool of donor hearts for transplantation. We were awarded $10,000 through the disbursement of funds from the Nobel Prize in cryo-electron microscopy. This work allowed us to produce a first novel therapeutic in microalgae designed to support prawn farmers whose industry had been decimated by a white spot virus outbreak. This funding allowed us to produce the protein and conduct the first field trials. Members of the Director's Circle play a significant role in the critically urgent work of IMB. Your contribution lights the way to our next big discovery. So thank you so much everyone for joining us both online and in the room today. We really appreciate your attendance and uh, we hope to see you again next year at more of our Meet the Researchers. Our researchers are now going to conduct some tours here for um, some of the people in the room. So we'll get onto that, but um, we hope to see you again very shortly. Thanks everyone, bye.